Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Talha. I am a trust career doctor working in Nottingham University Hospital. For those of you who have joined earlier, you know that there is a uh, this is a surgical lecture series, and we are we are always live on Thursday at 6 p.m. Today we had to change a bit because our speaker uh, was not available by that time, and he is. Uh, I, I'm really thankful because he has driven uh, and he has agreed to give this lecture. So I'm very thankful for that. So uh, for those who are joining today, uh, this is a 40 to uh, minutes to one hour lecture with question and answers at the end. We are trying to cover as much as surgical topics as possible. And uh, so before wasting any time, uh, over to you. Uh, we have. Uh, Mr. Noman Shahzad, he is an ST5 uh, trainee of vascular surgery at uh, YNH Deanery. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Tala. And uh, thank you very much, very much for organizing all this. I think uh, a lot of effort goes into that, but I think you are doing a great job. And um, this uh, would be hopefully very helpful for the candidates. Um, so I will share my screen. Yeah. 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 Right. That's great. Okay, that's great. Um so I presume the candidates are preparing for MRCSA. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I will, um, so while, while making this presentation, I had a lot of difficulty because I was not sure what to put and what not to put. Um, but I have, I have put uh, basics of uh, uh, so, sort of most of the surgical topics, which should be important for from basic understanding uh, from MRCS point of view, but I'm not exactly sure what exactly the criteria is. Um, so I will go through the topics. We will discuss a little bit of details and uh, I will not go into a lot of details. Obviously we need to cover in 40 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, do stop me and uh, ask the questions. And at the end, we can have further questions. And uh, if you feel like there are any topics that are not covered somehow and you want some other session for a little bit of more details, I'm happy to do another session. That's very nice of you. So we'll go forward from here. So a little bit about uh, amputations. Um, so amputations, um, we know there, there are various types. But for the sake of uh, MRCS, I think it's there, there are a few important amputations we need to know. And we need to know indications when to do those amputations and uh, when not to do amputations and why to do those amputations. Um, so starting from uh, uh, lower down uh, from the toes. So obviously there are toes amputations. And if there is, no involvement of the head of metatarsal bones, then this is just the toe amputation. If along with metatars, uh, along with toes, there is involvement of the metatarsal bone. If it's only single metatarsal bone involvement, this is called ray amputation. And if these are uh, more than one, then this is called metatarsal amputation. And if all the five metatarsal bones are involved, then we say that this is transmetatarsal amputation or TMA. Going further proximally, there are tarsal bones like the cuneiforms and the navicular. So if we go up to the tarsal bones, this is called Lisfranc amputation, which is not very common because functional outcomes are not very good, but, but just for the sake to know the name of um, Transtarsal amputation is a Lis Frank amputation. Then trans ankle amputation is called Symes amputation. That is also not common because functional outcome are not good, very rarely to be done. More common uh, among the major amputations are uh, below knee amputation, which is also called transtibial amputation. So this kind of amputation is done about 12 to 15 centimeter below the tubular, tubular, uh, tibial tuberosity. Um, 
and uh, then there are two kind two common kind of flaps we can make there are many multiple kind, kind of kind of flap but there are two more common one is the long posterior flap burgess flap in which uh, we take the long posterior flap stitches anteriorly to make a stump and the other one is equal size flap also sort of kind of called fish mouth flap it's open like a fish and then you close it and form a, a proper stump um so if there is there is no there, there are few indications for each flaps like if the posterior skin is not good quality then we can prefer to do the equal flaps also called um, fish mouth flaps uh, and uh, uh, some people regularly do uh, equal flaps or the fish mouth flaps and um, but most commonly it's the burgess flap which is commonly used because anteriorly there is just the bone tibial bone and uh, what are, whatever kind of amputation we do below knee amputation we have to go we have to divide the tibia anterior compartment and lateral compartment at the same level if we divide that and we don't divide the skin at that level then the blood supply of the skin sometimes is questionable so posterior long flap burgess flap gives a better vascularity Further up is it through knee amputation, also called uh, uh, gritty stroke amputation, in which case we go through the uh, knee joint, divide the condyles of the fem uh, femur, and keep the patella intact and move the patella backwards. This is also not common, but in young patients, energetic patients who have good muscle strength, this is, this is good amputation for those. Then is above knee amputation, also called transfemoral amputation. This is uh, about 15 to uh, 12 to 15 centimeter above the knee joint. And commonly it's performed like a equal flap, uh, anterior posterior fish mouth. Going further up is hip disarticulation, mean through the hip joint. And uh, if you have to take down all the muscles of the hip as well, this is called hemipelvectomy, also called hind quarter amputation. So that's just the name and level of the amputation that we need to know and why, why we do uh, uh, that kind of amputations. Uh, there are a few indications of various major amputations. The most common the vascular surgeons deal with is the non-revascularizable ischemia. So if it's the acute ischemia, patient comes late, then obviously we do that amputation and chronic ischemia, there is no further revascularization option and uh, uh, leg is not either viable or patient is having chronic pain. So, to, 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 so, so we do the amputation. Before we do the amputation, it's very important what level amputation we do, we ensure that the blood supply is reaching at that level. For example, there is a patient uh, who comes in with chronic limb ischemia he has uh, occluded superficial femoral artery, popliteal, and there is nothing below, and foot is not vi viable. But the skin below the knee is viable. So what kind of amputation would you recommend at this point? Uh, any, 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 anyone want to make a wild guess? No. Okay, so general tendency is if, if this kind of question comes where they mention that skin below the knee is viable, uh, but vascularity right from after the common femoral artery is not good, below knee amputation stump will never heal. So in these kind of situations, go above knee. Below knee amputation stump will heal if there is a very good profunda. SFA is occluded, that's fine. But if, if it's a very good profunda, then you can do below knee amputation. But if it's compromised profunda, SFA is gone, below knee amputation will not heal. Other indication is sepsis, especially the diabetic septic patients, though they may have very good vascularity, but they have necrotizing infection, you need to get rid of it. So you do an emergency amputation, which is called a guillotine amputation, means like you do quick operation, get rid of the sepsis, and then formalize the amputation, proper amputation later for the good functional outcome. Trauma, obviously in that, mostly in trauma cases, you don't need to worry about the vascularity, but it's, it's a 
common indication of the amputation as well. And sometimes to improve the function, for example, if somebody develops contractures due to X, Y, Z reasons, and um, keeping the foot or keeping the leg is more problematic than, than doing the amputation, then, then we do the amputation. Right, these are the two questions I have put in from uh, the questions Talha shared with me. So uh, someone wants to attempt the first question, please. I would try to make it interactive. If uh, you guys uh, participate, then it would be more sort of a learning uh, experience. Yeah, if somebody wants to participate, they can uh, speak up or they can uh, write in the chat, I think. Yeah. So first question is operation of a choice for a 1990, 90-year-old lady with infected gangrene of the midfoot, secondary to the diabetes. She has fixed flexion deformity of the knee. So what kind of amputation is most appropriate for this lady? Chopart amputation. Chopart, okay. So if it's a, a septic patient, uh, then yes, it's a temporary amputation. You get rid of the foot and then deal with it later. Any any other wild guess? Or maybe not wild guess. Some, some uh, sort of... Uh, sorry, there, there was a break. Above knee amputation. Above knee amputation, yeah. The reason being, uh, I think that's the right answer for the say. If, if they have not mentioned sepsis here, then the above knee amputation is the right answer. Reason being, she has got a fixed flexion deformity. She will never use uh, uh, the knee joint. So there is no point in saving the knee joint. Even if you save it, that would be more of a problem for the patient mobilizing from wheelchair to the bed. She will hit, hit her stump and she will get ulcer that will never heal again. Okay, next patient is amputation of the lower limb in which femoral condyles are removed and the patella is re retained. That should be straightforward. Grit stroke amputation, through knee amputation. So, okay, moving forward. Another question. 23 year old man presents with intermittent symptoms of altered sensation in his arm and discomfort when he uses his hands. He works as an electrician and his symptoms are worst when he is fitting light fixtures. What is the most common differential in this kind of situation? Thoracic outlet syndrome. That's correct. So, when we see these kind of scenarios, the first thing that comes to mind is the thoracic outlet. And obviously there are many things that you need to rule out, but this is kind of a typical scenario of a thoracic outlet syndrome. So we, I will talk about a little bit about the thoracic outlet syndrome. So thoracic outlet, as the name suggests, it is the outlet from the thorax to the arm. So, sorry. So in, in this figure, uh, can you see my cursor? on the screen yes you can uh, yes yes when when i'm moving okay yeah so in this figure so thoracic outlet is basically an outlet so which is bound inferiorly by the first rib this one superiorly here by the clavicle and this roof is formed by the this muscle which is called scalenus anterior arises from the later processes of this uh, cervical spine attaches to the uh, upper end of the first rib and scalenus medius again arises from the later processes and attaches on the first rib. There is a scalenus posterior that that is not involved with the thoracic outlet and it goes up to the second rib there. Right. So thoracic outlet syndrome basically involves three, three kind of structures coming in or going out of the thoracic outlet. One is the axillary vein that becomes subclavian vein after the first rib. This is bound by the costoclavicular triangle. The costo means vertebra, clavicle, and there's a subclavius muscle here, and there's a costoclavicular ligament here. This, this space can sometimes be very tight, can cause compression of the vein and leads to symptoms related to the vein. And then artery runs behind the scalenus anterior muscle. And the brachial plexus runs in the 
uh, same triangle, scalene triangle, which is bounded by the scalenous anterior, scalenous posterior, and inferiorly by the first ring. So three kind of structures. So there are three types of thoracic outlet syndromes, neurogenic, arterial, and venous. So the, but the, the kind of symptoms dictate what kind of thoracic outlet uh, syndrome it is. The most common we see is neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, which is 95% of the whole thoracic outlet syndromes. Then is the venous, which is about 3%, then is the arterial about 2%. This, this is more, more detailed anatomy. So thoracic outlet, one was the thoracic outlet uh, bounded by the first rib and the clavicle, but the space behind the pectoralis minor where all three structures pass through. This is also called, this is also when we uh, group the uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, the, the thoracic uh, pectoralis minus minor triangle is also grouped under the uh, thoracic outlet syndromes. So there could be a compression even in this area, especially in patients who use uh, upper limb a lot and their pectoralis minus minor muscle is quite hypertrophied and there's, there's, there's a uh, quite tight space behind the pectoralis minor. And, and this is just the demonstration when patients, people work overhead, they have to like abduct and extend their arms. There is a stretch onto the artery veins and nerves. And if there's a tight space, this stretch uh, will lead to the symptoms even more, especially in, if the, the if the space is tight. So as I said, neurogenic 95% scalene triangle. And the most common reason for the neurogenic thoracic outlet is uh, basically the uh, fibers of the muscles that are encasing the brachial flexors. So, this is sometimes the fibers, sometimes this is the hypertrophy, sometimes it is the fibrosis. So when we explore the neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome further in detail, we figure out uh, either they had uh, some neck trauma in the past, some time ago, like years ago, sometimes road traffic accident, whiplash injury, they causes some muscle tear hematoma. The hematoma resolves, but the fibrosis goes on years and years, and sometimes it entraps the uh, uh, nerve fibers and gives the symptoms of the thoracic outlet. Accessory rib, which is also commonly seen in these kind of patients, and more than the ribs are just the fibrous band at the point of the rib. So this fibrous band on top of the first rib, it reduces the space, scalene space, and gives symptoms of the neurogenic as well as arterial thoracic outlet syndrome. There sometimes there is a deformity, congenital deformity or after trauma deformity of the first rib. And uh, history of trauma is very important, especially in neurogenic thoracic outlet. Venus is a tight space costoclavicular triangle. And uh, the people, who use upper limbs more, for example, swimmer, musicians, bodybuilders, uh, their subclavius muscle can also be hypertrophied and this space can be quite narrow. So they, they can get a deep vein thrombosis of this upper limb and axillary vein. Um, that's also called the Pejoschwerter syndrome. You don't need to, I don't think you need to remember the name, but uh, the deep vein thrombosis of the axillary vein is called, also named after um, someone who discovered is that there, there were two, two different people, Paget and Schroeter. Arterial, again, bounded by the arterial triangle. So risk factors are first rib, uh, fibrous band, deformed, uh, deformed first rib, accessory rib, and uh, obviously hypertrophy scalene muscles can lead, lead to the arterial. So what, what symptoms? So neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome will give symptoms similar to the Renaud phenomena, like hyperreactive, sometimes there will be hyperreactive uh, vascularity in the cold weather, the hand will go, go, go white. Sometimes there will be ongoing numbness, which is exacerbated with the overhead uh, uh, movements. 
and uh, sometimes if it's ongoing chronic there will be muscle wasting power power loss and uh, uh, muscle weakness as well venous presents by the dvt and arterial thoracic outlet it presents by ischemia but more commonly it presents by the microthromboembolism so with this this compression they get post stenotic dilatation that results into aneurysm of the distal subclavian or the axillary artery this aneurysm sometimes has a clot that throws thrombi uh, which embolizes distally and then they present with the blue finger kind of sim symptoms like the fingers going blue and obviously one differential in these kind of situ situations again is the renault phenomena and obviously we need to look after look for uh, uh, where else the emboli can come from like the heart or uh, some atherosclerotic process and uh, like further differentials but this is the most common presentation of the arterial toss as well uh, that's the symptoms i have described um, so evaluation so we take the history obviously and uh, we feel for all the pulses uh, we check motor and sensory uh, systems document all that we compare our all findings with the contralateral side um, we do the blood pressure measurements and sometimes there is a difference in the blood pressure measurement of the affected arm versus the other arm uh, affected arm obviously will be low um, then is the dynamic testing means like Edson test is a commonly performed test for the thoracic outlet where you feel for the pulse take the arm in abducted position like as if like stretching the uh, veins and the arteries underneath the pectoralis minor as well as against the scalene muscles and then let the patient uh, literally flex on the contralateral side and extend the neck and then you take the arm up and feel for either the pulse will, will disappear or it will get weaker this is not very specific test because in, in even in normal people if you if you do this test on your colleague you will be surprised that about 20 percent of the people will have this test positive so it's not very specific but give some idea investigations obviously you do all the baseline investigations uh, then uh, you'll do the arterial investigations if it's arterial toss like uh, duplex and uh, you do ct angiogram which is a beneficial in terms that it can see the accessory rib as well and uh, then you do, um, do the mri scans to look for the hypertrophy of the muscles and for the neurogenic toss you do can do the nerve conduction studies and electromyography and to rule out autoimmune disease like the Raynaud's, you do autoimmune workup so basically the adson test is important from uh, mrcsa point of view and then uh, what kind of investigations for the vascular toss toss means like thoracic outlet syndrome like duplex to start with and ct angiogram and then sometimes mr angiogram if you are specifically looking for the fibrous bands and if the end toss then nerve conduction studies and emg treatment especially for the neurogenic toss you try not to do an intervention because it's very high risk intervention you may give more harm than the benefit so physiotherapy conservative management as much as possible but if the patient start developing muscle weakness and uh, rest pain ongoing pain all the time in that case yeah you do the intervention so what is the most common intervention is the resection of the rib you go either through the axilla or below the clavicular or above the clavicle depending upon what kind of toss it is if it's venous for example it's anterior you go infraclavicular if it's neurogenic you go through the axilla take the first rib out you can even take the scal anterior scalenus muscle out remove that uh, make that space wider and it works very well sometimes you don't take the rib out and you just do scalene myotomy and so it, it is it's enough right uh, any questions for thoracic outlet so far no Okay, so there is a 19 year old lady presents with recurrent episode of pain in her hand. She notices that her symptoms are worst in cold weather. When she gets the pain, she notices that her hands are very pale 
then they become dark blue in color. So what do you think what's going on here? Raynaud's. Yeah, this is more typical of Raynaud's. Uh, but obviously the patient comes with typical history of Raynaud's, we need to rule out thoracic outlet. They come with thoracic outlet, we need to rule out Raynaud and other differentials. Right, another, uh, it's, it's not as common clinically, but I think academically it's more common, uh, subclavian steel syndrome. So in patients who have a proximal subclavian art artery stenosis or the occlusion, what happens is uh, the, because we know that the subclavian artery gives a branch, which is called vertebral artery and vertebral artery on the both sides form the vertebrobasilar system, and then it goes to the circle of villus, and it joins the circulation from the anterior circulation supplied by the internal carotid arteries. But at the same time, uh, the subclavian artery supplies the arm. If there is occlusion or stenosis of the subclavian artery before the vertebral artery, what happens is if someone is using the arm, there is increase in the demand of the uh, blood to the arm that because, because of this occlusion, it cannot supply enough. There is a steal of the blood from the vertebral artery. What it causes is it causes the cerebellar ischemia and uh, patients usually get dizzy and uh, uh, sometimes syncopal episode uh, with use of the arm. So this is, this is typical of uh, subclavian steel syndrome, also sometimes called the vertebral, vertebral steel syndrome. Um, from management point of view, uh, either we do the, if it's uh, just the stenosis, we do the stenting. And if it's complete occlusion, then we do carotid subclavian bypass, provided that the carotid arteries are, are not, is, are free of the disease. We do the sub, uh, carotid subclavian bypass. It increases the pressure into the subclavian arteries and the uh, vertebral anti-grade flow is uh, restored. So that's the subclavian steel syndrome. There are a few messages in the chat. Please do not forget to, okay, that's fine. Um, right, going forward. So then, Little bit about chronic limb ischemia. I don't think you need to remember the classification, but I have put it just to show you uh, an idea of grades of ischemia. So zero means asymptomatic, do not have chronic limb ischemia. They start with the claudication. Claudication means when they use their calf muscles by walking or going up, up stay or, or, or uh, running, they start having pain. And when they take rest, the pain goes away. So this is typical of uh, vascular claudication. So the differential is neurogenic claudication. So neurogenic claudication is, is atypical, like when going uphill is better. And uh, it's uh, sometimes it's worse in the sitting position. So typical ischemic claudication is using more muscles, you get ischemia. As soon as you take the rest, the pain goes away. You start the activity again after similar kind of uh, distance, you start the getting the pain again. So that's very typical of uh, ischemia claudication. So mild, then it goes to moderate, severe, to the point that patients start having the rest pain. Rest pain starts at night most of the time because there they are no diversions, like you are not thinking of other things during the day, uh, during the night. So you have the nighttime pain and then they start getting ischemic ulcers. Ischemic ulcers are most commonly at the tiptoes, sometimes at the heel. Um, and then obviously next stage is the gangrene. Uh, that's just a picture to show how the atherosclerotic process uh, uh, goes through various stages um, in, in patients who ultimately come to us with the critical limb ischemia. So it's, it's, I think it's from stage one, which is IMT, inter, in, intima media thickness increase, to reach the occlusion, typically it takes about 30 years. Sometimes risk factors are more, it takes less, 
and uh, patient it is very well controlled in one situation it takes more but typically it takes about 25 to 30 years uh, to reach from intimomedia thickness to the occlusion so for example if if some some 30 year old guy is smoking now and uh, his hypercholesteremic or diabetic or, or is not looking after his diet and is not exercising the process starts and by the time he reaches 60 he will have the problems so the prevention should start right at the beginning so what happens in media thickness there are no clinical findings whatsoever when you look at with the naked eye then started up start appearing the fatty sticks then those fatty sticks start having some core core lipids which is called atheromas and sometimes there is ulcerations of the atheromas whenever there is ulceration there is platelet plug with the platelet plug fibrin plug and calcification and the process goes on and uh, the 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 calcifications keep keep getting accumulated cholesterol keeps getting accumulated cycle of ulceration platelet plug and all that keeps going and ultimately there is a stenosis and into the stenosis at some point there is a rupture of the plaque and it goes to the occlusion so that that happens as a sort of we call it as acute and chronic ischemia kind of picture so that is that is generally the the, the process uh, symptoms we know I, I don't think we, i need to go into detail but uh, ischemia symptoms as we discussed claudication pain pallor ne neuromuscular deficit ultimately weakness and paresthesias rest pain and uh, dependent rubor rubor means the redness in the foot so redness in, in sometimes is mistaken as if blood supply is more it's, it's not sign of a more blood supply redness happens because there is a ischemic foot let's say there is not enough blood supply in 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 for example in a level position then you put the leg down there is a slightly increase in pressure slightly more blood goes towards foot the tissues were ischemic they were kind of hungry for the oxygen they take away all all or most of the oxygen from the blood deoxygenated blood it gives the purplish reddish color to the skin this is not a sign of obviously increased blood supply this gives this is sign of a deoxygenated blood as well as obviously there is ischemia going on there is uh, more chemo uh, uh, chemical mechanisms that causes the arterial capillary dilatation increased permeability and all that uh, so there is a dependent rubor in ischemia patients, which is a sunset sign, like it's, it's a sign of ischemia. Examination, obviously you do all the examinations. I, do, I don't think I need to go like examination, uh, like signs of ischemia. You check for the pulses, you check for capillary refill, you check for uh, uh, sensory motor deficit. But what is more important, I think, from MRCS point of view, is the Berger test. Berger test is you straight leg raising test kind of thing. You raise the leg up, and you typically in a critical ischemic patients, you see that the leg goes white, and after that you dangle it down, and uh, they get it gets a reactive hyperemia kind of picture, which which is positive for the ischemia. Normally, it should not be that 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 stark. Ankle brachial pressure index, very, very important clinical examination test. You measure the pressure at the uh, brachial with the help of a handheld Doppler. And then you measure the pressure in one of the ankle arteries, either anterior tibial or posterior tibial artery. And uh, you divide the uh, ankle pressure with the brachial pressure, you get the index. Up to 0.9 or 0.8 is considered to be normal. Less than that, it's considered to be ischemia. Less than 0.3 is considered to be critical ischemia uh, that needs revascularization. But this is not a very uh, accurate test. It gives, gives you a very good idea, but 
if you want to do revascularization, you cannot entirely depend upon ABPI, especially in diabetic patients. They have calcified vessels, the non-compressible vessels. You may get false readings of very good ABPI, but the patient is having um, ischemia. Um, then going on to the investigations, pros and cons of various investigations. So generally we start with the duplex. Duplex is a combination of uh, Doppler and uh, uh, B mode uh, uh, ultrasound. So when you do combine those together, it's called the duplex. Uh, so it, it assess the flow into the arteries. It gives you waveform, it gives you velocity parameters, it gives you uh, the, the dynamics of the blood flow. And it's, it's very, very important investigations to look, look for the stenosis calcification as well as uh, uh, to uh, assess uh, uh, if there's any need for revascularization. But if you want to do any revascularization, uh, nowadays, uh, most of the patients end up having a cross-sectional imaging, either in the form of magnetic resonance imaging or CT angiograms. The, the benefit of the magnetic resonance imaging is gadolinium contrast is not that nephrotoxic and you could have very good uh, uh, delineation of the muscles. But CT is quick to perform. Even if you have uh, metallic heart valves, pacemaker or anything, you can, you can do the CTA. Uh, but the far, uh, hindsight obviously is that you're giving the contrast and these patients who are having uh, limb ischemia, they have underlying disease that affects the heart, affects the kidneys, and they are prone to have uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. Catheter and angiograms for the sake of diagnosis only are rare nowadays, but obviously for the sake of treatment, uh, very common. Coming to the treatment, best medical therapy means like uh, uh, one type of antiplatelet, either aspirin or clopidogrel, and statin is a must. Blood pressure control, good diabetes control, risk factor modification, stop smoking, do exercise, improve your diet, um, low cholesterol, low fat diet, um, and uh, more vegetable fibers. Then supervised exercise. It, it may be unsupervised, uh, actually, if the patients are reliable. So regular exercise and um, uh, try to push yourself so that new vascularization can improve. Revascularization only if above above measures fail or the patient comes in with a rest pain, cannot do exercise or with a tissue loss. In that case, yes, we do revascular. But claudicants encourage to do the exercise and try not to do the revascularization because revascularization is not free of its own uh, complications. Briefly, Short segment stenosis or occlusion, we do angioplasty. If it's very calcified, we put in a stent. If it's a disc of rupture, we put a covered stent, otherwise uncovered stent, self-expanding self metallic stents are enough. In some areas, you cannot put the stents. For example, groin, where there is a movement, knee joint, where there is a movement, you cannot put the stent. Stent will break after some time. So in those cases, either you have to do endotrectomy, means like clearing off the intima media through the operation, or you do the bypass. Bypass means you take blood from, from the area where there's a very good blood supply and put it to the area after which the blood supply going up to the foot is good. So you can use patients own autologous great saphenous vein or cephalic veins, or if there are no good veins, then you can use prostate. Few, few requirements for the bypass. They should be good in flow. They should be good conduit, means like bypass vein or the prosthetic. And they should be good outflow, means if the blood vessel you are putting a bypass on is stenosed distally, the bypass would definitely fail. So the vessel you put the bypass on should, should be good quality, should be going up to the foot. That's just the uh, 
pictorial demonstration of the bypass. In this instance, they take the bypass from the common femoral artery and join it to the uh, posterior tibial artery. So this is a long fem PT bypass. In this instance, they, they take it from the common femoral artery and join it to the either femoral or baloney popliteal artery. So there are many different kinds of bypasses, but the whole idea is to bypass from a healthy artery to a very good runoff. If, if, if for example, there is an iliac disease, you, do, you can do, if there is a bilateral iliac disease, you can do aorto bifemoral bypass, but this needs obviously laparotomy. If the patient is not fit enough, you can take from the axilla, axillo bifemoral bypass. So there, there are many different kinds of bypasses, but basic, basic principle should be followed. Then is the acute limb ischemia. Acute limb ischemia, again, while doing the assessment for the acute limb ischemia, one is the clinical assessment in which you assess, uh, obviously, five Ps, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulse, uh, and uh, what is another P? Uh, perfusion, I think, with capillary refill. So you clinically assess, assess the patients. And uh, uh, this is the grading, uh, just to give, give you an idea. So you clinically assess if there is a anesthesia, then that's not a good sign. If there's a paresthesia, that means it's immediately threatened foot. If there's a motor weakness that alarms the bell, you should act now. Otherwise, there's a good chance you will lose because in, in next two, three hours, it will develop into paralysis or if left even further into rigor mortis. Arterial Doppler signals, if they are audible, which is very good. If they are not audible, you should have a low threshold to do further investigations and uh, 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 any intervention. And venous Doppler signals, obviously in very ischemic patients, if the blood is not coming in, there is no blood to go out. So there will not be any venous Doppler signals and which is a very bad sign. Evaluation again for the acute limb ischemia, because it's acute, MRI takes like 30, 40 minutes. MRA is, is not a good, good investigations of choice for acute limb ischemia. So you do quick CT angiogram, start patient on anticoagulation. And if the CT confirms that there is acute embolus, then perform the embolectomy. Uh, another important uh, area to consider in, in so far as the MRCS is concerned, I think is the reperfusion injury. When there is an ischemia for three, four hours and you reperfuse all of a sudden, then there's a good chance of reperfusion injury, which means like toxin secretions from the muscles, some uh, myoglobin, some creatinine goes into the circulation and it causes general vasodilatation, patient goes hypotensive, myoglobin can cause acute kidney injury. Um, so in post-operative phase, patient can go quite sort of deteriorate rapidly. The other thing is that the, the muscles swell up and if there is no space for the leg muscles to swell up, they get necrosis, which is called compartment syndrome. So if there is, ischemia of three, four hours, you do reperfuse, have a low threshold of doing fasciotomy to either prevent or treat the compartment syndrome. And, and obviously good hydration to make sure that kidneys are flushed, they don't get AKI. Right, so th that was all about the ischemia. A rare scenario, but academically there could be a question for MRCS. Sometimes the popliteal artery does not follow its normal course. It goes either on the side of the gastrocnemius or through the gastrocnemius sometimes. The gastrocnemius has two slings and it goes through. It causes the compression of the artery. 
young patients when they do exercise they get the pain and they are concerned that there's something going on and when we do investigation we find out that there is a popliteal artery entrapment uh, into the muscles the treatment is obviously we divide the muscles because if you divide one head of the muscle gastrocnemius should not cause a significant functional problem uh, the other way is obviously you divide the artery and make an anastomosis Right. Any, any question about ischemia or any bypass or any revascularization? Uh, P, uh, PTFE grafts, uh, what's, uh, what's the indication of those? Uh, I think it's a little confusing for us to understand that. Okay. So when we do the bypass, uh, as, as I mentioned before, there are three requirements for a good bypass, for a durable bypass. One is good inflow. The second one is the good conduit. And third is the runoff. So good conduit means, uh, as per the latest evidence, the best conduit is the autologous vein. The great softness vein you take out and put as a bypass. That has the best uh, uh, long-term uh, patency rates. But if there is no great softness, good great softness vein, you try and get the cephalic vein and put it down. But the problem with the cephalic vein is they get aneurysmal because they are they are not uh, they they don't get arterialized so much. Um, the the other option in these kind of patients who don't have very good vein is to put a prosthetic bypass. Prosthesis there are very various different kinds. Two most common are PTFE or Dacron. So. In inguinal region, generally we put PTFE, slightly less risk of infection. Um, there are various formations of PTFE. Nowadays, everybody uh, uh, all, all over is the EPTFE, yeah, means like expanded PTFE. So if it's written somewhere PTFE, that, that means it is definitely EPTFE. Uh, problem with the EPTFE graphs is the potency rate is lower than the veins. Uh, and to improve the potency, sometimes what we do is we take a segment of the vein and put it as a cuff on the distal end of the anastomosis. So because once we put the graft in, the dynamics of the circulations change. The grafts are not that um, uh, expensile and blood is very used to be into the expensile arteries. So some dynamics change and they tend to get intimal hyperplasia. Intimal hyperplasia causes the, causes the graft stenosis and it goes down. So it has been seen that if you put a vein cuff, also called the Miller cuff or St. Mary cuff. So if you put a vein cuff at the end of the graft, the potency is better, but still not as good as autologous graft. So to summarize the answer is, if you don't have the autologous vein, then you have to use the graft. For the inferinguinal region, PTF is more preferred than the Dacron. Dacron is pre preferred for the supraingoinal, like the aortic bypasses. Evaluation of ulcers. Uh, this could also be an interesting area. There are various reasons behind the ulcers. I will go through uh, briefly. So ischemic ulcers, I already discussed, they will be on the tip of the toes, uh, sometimes onto the heels, like distal most areas. And or they will be, for example, if their trauma happens, skin breakdown, it never heals because of ischemia. So these kind of ulcers. Neuropathic ulcer means di diabetic neuropathy. So these kind of ulcers will be more into the pressure areas because they have neuropathy, they, they can't feel. So plantar aspect of the head of the first metatarsal, heel ulcers, um, medial malleolar ulcers because of ill-fitting shoes. So these, these kind of ulcers are more common in, in neuropathic. Venous ulcers, these are the venous uh, insufficiency, uh, increased pressure ulcers. They are more into the medial, medial uh, aspect of the leg, also called the gator's area. Um, Marginal ulcers, 
if there is a chronic ulcers, chronic inflammation, there could be a conversion to the squamous cell carcinoma. This is called marginal, but it takes like about 15, 20 years. Uh, infections can cause the ulcers, especially previous uh, non-healing fracture leading to the ulcer that can be confused with the vascular ulcers, but it's important we do vascular workup, rule it out, and then let them let it label it as infection. Inflammatory or autoimmune, especially pyoderma gangrenosum, gangrenosum in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And then there could be a mixed etiology. For example, diabetic patients can be ischemic as well. Uh, chronic venous insufficiency along with the arterial ischemia, so mixed kind of ulcers as well. So chronic venous insufficiency, uh, briefly I will go through. Uh, clinically, there will be leg swelling, visible veins, and sometimes because of hemosiderin deposition, uh, there is a fibrosis into the dermal area, there is port wine discoloration. These are the stigmata of chronic venous insufficiency. And because of fibrosis, the, the skin is quite tough. It's called lipodermatosclerosis. Because of this toughness of the skin in, in, in later stages, the edema does not happen into that area. And the edema happens into the relatively more proximal leg. This is more of a champagne bottle. So champagne kind of reverse champagne bottle legs. Gator area we discuss, and sometimes there is an inflammation into the superficial veins, which is called thrombophilivitis. Clinical evaluation for the veins, obviously we will look for all these, these signs. In their history, we will ask for the history of uh, bleeding, previous interventions, previous DVT, long bone fractures, then can prone, prone patients to venous insufficiency. But there are two clinical tests that can be important, I think, from MRCS point of view. One is the Brody Trendelenburg test. This is the test. Uh, we let the patient lie down, raise the leg up, press over the saphenofemoral junction area, let the patient stand, uh, either press or put a tunique, let the patient stand and see whether the veins are filling up or not. If the vein is filling up, that means there is insufficiency and it's not coming from the saphenofemoral junction, but it's coming from some of the perforators. Perforator means like connection of the superficial veins to the deep veins. If it's not filling anymore, that means it was a sphenofemoral junction that was a problem. But this test means you put a tunique relatively more, slightly tighter, 10-20 uh, millimeter of mercury pressure, and then let the patient walk. So if the patient develops pain after walking with a tunique, that means you did block the superficial vein and blood is not going back through the deep veins also. So this pathis test positive means there is some deep venous occlusion. So these are the tests. I think these are more of an academic significance at the moment. There are, in, in the clinical practice, we don't do this test anymore because duplex is so easily available. In the clinic, we just do the ultrasound and confirms. But for the sake of exams, I think it's important to know the a theory behind it and the, uh, the, the diagnostic reasons behind this. Just to quickly go through the anatomy, great softness vein starts from the saphenous, actually starts from the hair in, into the foot, uh, goes anterior to the medial malleolus, goes behind the knee, medial aspect of the thigh, goes into the sphenofemoral junction on the medial aspect of the inguinal ligament. Um, pierces through the area cribriform fascia. Uh, the anterior accessory saphenous vein is more lateral into the thigh and short saphenous vein is more into the midline posteriorly and saphenopopliteal junction, this junction usually behind the knee but it can be a little bit higher up. Giacomini vein is a vein that connects the great saphenous vein to the short saphenous vein so sometimes the varicosities may arise from the Giacomini vein. These are a few pictures to show how the um, varicose vein look like. So in the initial stages, it could just be a spider veins kind of thing, just the bluish discoloration. 
in this further stages, there could be visible veins, but there are no stigmata of chronic venous insufficiency. Then the patient may start developing some staining. And this is the stage of uh, fibrosis, lipodermatosclerosis, hemocidin deposition. Then this is a scar here, uh, which means that the ulcer, there was an ulcer which is now healed. So, but this is also stigmata of uh, chronic venous insufficiency. And this is an active ulcer, which is the advanced stage of the chronic venous insufficiency. You do duplex, and that should be enough in most of the cases. In rare cases, when you still cannot find out the source of reflux, you should MR venograms. Venograms as such are very rare for the diagnostics purpose, unless there is a pelvic uh, sort of venous insufficiency. First line treatment in all patients is the compression, provided there is no arterial supply compromise. For edema, the compression goes up to 20 millimeter of mercury. For ulcers, the compression has to be up to 40 millimeter of mercury for the, for the ulcers to heal. In terms of in invasive treatments, endovenous ablations are the first line treatment of choice at the moment. Open surgery is not the first line treatment. You assess the patient for the endovenous ablation. Endovenous ablation means like you burn the vein either via the laser or via the radiofrequency ablations. And uh, if the patient is not suitable for laser ablation or radiofrequency ablation, then you offer the patient the open operation. Other, other measures could be sclerotherapy, means you inject the STD foam and you let the patient uh, le le let it sclerose, but it's more common for the small veins. In the whole trunk, the efficacy is not very good. And uh, surgery, the traditional surgery was the saphenofemoral junction ligation, stripping of the veins and stab avulsions. We don't see that common anymore, but that's the procedure we should know for the exam purpose as well and that's called the uh, Strandelenberg procedure. Um, quick questions. Uh, what time is it? Only five minutes left. Um, 66 men referred via the aneurysm screening program with an abdominal aortic aneurysm of 4.4. Apart from well-controlled type 2 diabetes, he is otherwise well. In terms of management, what should we do about this patient? Any guesses? There is no wrong answer. Well, there can be, but uh, this is not. Uh, uh, you, you should not shy away. Follow up on ultrasound. Follow That's up true. On That's true. Continuous surveillance, 4.4 centimeter, is not an indication for the treatment. 72 year old man has a CT scan for abdominal discomfort and uh, uh, suspects triple A. The, there was a CT scan that shows 6.6 .6 centimeter aneurysm. Uh, with the neck, which is also aneurysmal, and it continues to involve the right common iliac. The left common iliac artery is occluded. He's hypertensive, type 2 diabetic, which is well controlled. So 6.6 .6 aneurysm, what should we do? So he needs some kind of treatment. Why? Because this reason. Uh, if the aneurysm is less than four, there is very, very minimal risk of rupture, annual risk of rupture. Four to five, it goes up to five, but rather newer literature shows that even up to five centimeter, the annual risk of rupture is two to three percent. It's not even five percent. Five to six, bit more risk of rupture, but the, the size goes beyond six, the risk of rupture increases exponentially to the extent that half of the patients who have eight centimeter aneurysm, they will not be alive after one year. And uh, eight, more than eight centimeter, 90% risk of rupture in five years. So indication for any intervention is 5.5 centimeter uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So beyond that, continue surveillance. Uh, beyond means like uh, smaller than that, continue surveillance. Beyond that, indication for treatment. Uh, we do the treatment because there is obviously a risk of rupture. 
and uh, management options either you do open operation or you do endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair um, there are different indications but as per nice recommendation which is a uk guidelines uh, which is followed uh, if you don't follow nice guidelines you can end up with lit litigations so nice recommends offer open abdominal aortic aneurysm operation whenever suitable uh, if suitable means like patient can tolerate the operation. If not suitable for open operation, then offer the endovascular aneurysm repair. Means like patient is quite moribund because EVAR can be done even under local anesthesia. Uh, you go through the groins, you put the stent graft in and come back. So syst systemically, it's not a lot insult. But with open aneurysm, you do laparotomy, you clamp the aorta, you keep the limbs uh, not perfused for about till the time doing an astomosis, sometimes about an hour. And then you reperfuse. There's a risk of reperfusion, a, a lot going on. So patients have to be really fit to have the open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Uh, how much is left? I think a few more slides. I will go uh, uh, relatively quick. So Charcot foot. Uh, we should know Charcot foot also called Charcot arthropathy. On the right side is a foot which should be normal, like the foot arches should be normal and should be arching like that. But what happens in Charcot arthropathy, there is some minor trauma which is unmissed in diabetic patients. All the ligaments and joints, uh, uh, all the ligaments and tendons, they get lax because of undergoing uh, underlying uh, diabetic neuropathy, they don't realize they don't have a lot of pain. And ultimately, there is a foot collapse. So this this sometimes this happens like process starts and it happens in about two months. In two months from normal foot, they go to the short foot. foot. So the problem obviously is it's a rocker bottom foot, more of more pressure areas, more risk of ulcerations. And in diabetic patients who are neuropathic, it's, 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 not, it's not good. There are operations we can restore the uh, deformity, but not, not very promising operations. <laughs> Little bit about the dissections. Dissections, we know that it's the tear into the intima and the blood goes into the subintimal layer and uh, separates the subintimal layer from the uh, adventitial or uh, intimal layer uh, from the medial layer. So sometimes it starts right from the, so most common about 60% of the dissections are into the ascending aorta. So it's tear here, blood goes, keep dissecting all the way down. Sometimes it stops as the bifurcation. Sometimes tear starts distal to the left subclavian and it can go up to the aorta. So dissections, the treatment uh, usually on the right side because, because of the complex anatomy, it's the open operation. And on the left side, either you observe and see how the patient goes in ITU. If there is any worsening, you put a stent in and try to block the uh, dissection point. Uh, anything else you need to know about dissection? I don't think so. Uh, so prompt diagnosis, type A, which is ascending aortic dissection have a lot high mortality, you should do operation sooner and not wait, while the type B, you can wait and see whether operation is needed. Hypoperfusion syndrome means like when the dissection is going into the artery, it can it can take away the blood from the branches, means like SMA, celiac, renal, so this can cause hypoperfusion syndromes. That's all, that's, that's all I could think about uh, considering for MRCSA candidates from vascular surgery point of view. Uh, do let me know if you have any questions and uh, do let me know if you want me to cover any other topics at some later date. Yeah. So if I, anyone has any questions, you, they can type or they can speak up as the lecture is over. Uh, so can you uh, just uh, explain uh, briefly what would be prophylaxis for DVT uh, when uh, the patient also has uh, uh, limb ischemia or arterial lesion as well? So what will be DVT prophylaxis in that scenario? Okay. 
So prophylaxis, you mean um, uh, the patient uh, at an increased risk of DVT and yeah. uh, we just need to prophylax, not the treat. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, after a surgery. Uh, if he's an increased risk after a surgery, so and he also has some kind of limb ischemic lesion. So what would be uh, prophylaxis then? Limb ischemia, uh, so DVT prophylaxis, um, um, in terms of uh, mechanical prophylaxis, we use, um, uh, they, they tend to use these stockings, the TED stocking, thromboembolic stockings, which are five millimeter of mercury pressure maximum. Um, and uh, sometimes they use the pneumatic compression, especially in ITU patients who are even higher risk. So in those patients, if you, you can't feel the pulses, then these are contraindicated. So don't, don't put the TED stockings, don't put the pneumatic compression, intermittent uh, compressions. Um, but in terms of mechanical, or in terms of pharmacological prophylaxis, it's the same. It doesn't affect uh, uh, irrespective of the ischemia. But yeah, that's, that's important. Uh, if there is a, you can't feel the pulses, don't put, put the TED stockings. Uh, so we will uh, lean more uh, towards low molecular weight heparins or uh, those kind of treatments, but not the mechanical kind of treatments. No. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. So I think this is all. Any other questions? Uh, there's something in the chat. No, I've responded to that. Oh, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much today. Uh, it was a very lovely lecture. Thank you for your time. Uh, so guys, we'll meet next week with the same, with an, another person and another topic. So uh, good luck to you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the help. It was pretty good lecture. Thank you. Thank you.